In this third unit of the course, again, we're looking at the mind-body problem, the relation between the mental side of our existence and the physical side of our existence and what we should think about that. As we've seen, there is a range of views, there's a spectrum of views, a range of positions that you can take on this issue. Obviously, there's no simple answer to this question. What is the relation between mind and brain? Here again, I would say at one end of the spectrum, substance dualism holds that the two are independent, the two are distinct and independent. Brain states cause mental states, but brain states, but excuse me, mental states act on the physical world as well. So the two are distinct and act in independently, although they, they interact. And we've seen Foster's defense of that view. That would definitely be one end of the spectrum. A little bit closer to the middle would be a, another version of dualism here again, epiphenomenalism, according to which the two are distinct. Mental states are not just the same thing as brain states. They, they can't be identified with brain processes. They emerge out of them for whatever reason. But they're epiphenomenal. They, themsel they themselves are not causes. All causation is from the bottom up, from, from the brain to the mind. And for whatever reason, this epiphenomenon just does kind of emerge out of what is going on at the level of brain processes. And for whatever reason, it's just kind of floating along for the ride, as it were, but all causation is, is at the level of the physical, is at the level of brain processes. So causation is only bottom-up. Mental states are distinct from physical states of the brain, but they themselves don't bring about anything. They're epiphenomenal. And we've looked at a couple of versions of materialism. I would say at the opposite end of the spectrum from substance dualism here again would be identity theory, according to which the mind and brain just are the same thing. Mental states just are brain states. The two are to be identified. And then we saw that view challenged by other materialist approaches. Proponents of functionalism, as we've seen, hold that the mental is plastic. And this thesis, the plasticity of the mental, here again means that a mind could be realized in any number of physical arrangements, not only a specific biological organ, the brain, but in principle could be realized in computers, AI systems, because mental states just are functional states. So anything that can have a functional state, whether it be whether it be a specific biological organ, the brain, or something artificial, would have a mind, could in, could in principle have, in mind, have a mind. And we've looked at Cyril's criticisms of functionalism. Now we're going to turn to Nagel's criticisms of any materialist uh, account of mind, materialist accounts of mind more generally. And I would say the same about Nagel that I said with respect to Cyril. In this article, he's not laying out his own view. Our main concern here is just to understand his criticisms of any materialist approach to the mind. He denies that the mental can be reduced to the physical and that is the focus of his argument in this influential article, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Again, like Cyril, again, like many philosophers uh, in the history of philosophy, such as Hume, as we've seen, his method here is negative. His main focus is to tear down what he takes to be false views of the mind, uh, wrong-headed misconceived theories about what the relation between the mind and the brain is. So he's mainly concerned in this article to clear away the wreckage of false views. He's engaged in a kind of creative destruction, trying to open, open the path, open a way to new views of the relation between 
mind, and brain. He has a gift for very simple arguments. Nagel is very good at putting the points in, in very simple direct terms. He's not simplistic. He doesn't oversimplify the complexity of the issues involved. But what I mean is he has a real gap, I'm sorry, he has a real gift for finding gaps in philosopher's reasoning. So he looks at any theorist of mine, any philosopher, who reasons from A to B, uh, and from B to C, and from C to D. And he's very good at finding gaps in the inferential process, steps in the reasoning process, where the philosopher has overlooked some profound philosophical questions, some very substantive philosophical issues is simply being overlooked. And so that's the that's the philosophical style that uh, he oftentimes employs as in as in this article. So he poses this question, can materialism account for qualitative consciousness? Here again, consciousness is one of these distinguishing marks of the mental. It's one of these distinctive traits of our mental states, one of these marks of the mental consciousness in this unit of the course we've, all, we've also focused on intentionality, this capacity that the mind has to represent the world uh, in various ways, this capacity that mental states have to be about the world. And consciousness is also one of the distinctive marks of the mental. We just are aware of our internal states in a, in a way that, here again, is distinctive to the mental. We just are aware of all these different mental states that we go through, all these cognitive states that we go through, as well as things like sensations, perception, all the different mental states that we go through, we're, we're aware of, we're conscious of, and in a way that Nagel thinks is essential to the nature of mind. And the reason he rejects any materialist account of mind is that, as he sees it, no physicalist approach or materialist approach can account for this aspect of the mental. Nagel says, we have at present no conception of what an explanation of the physical nature of a mental phenomenon would be. So he's kind of trying to stop the physicalist view, the materialist view, in its tracks. He, he's not saying here that it, it seems improbable to him that we will, brain science will never advance to the point where we can complete the reduction. It's that right at the outset, there's a kind of conceptual problem in trying to even start this project of reducing the mental to the physical. Namely, the fact that, as he puts it here, we don't even know what it would mean to say that. We don't have any conception of what it would mean to give a physical explanation of a mental phenomenon. So... One way that he makes this point uh, is to ask, what is it like to be a bat? And he conducts a kind of thought experiment here. And the thought experiment begins from the thought that with respect to any conscious entity, with respect to any entity that has mental states, that has experiences, there is something that it's like to be that entity. For any organism that has conscious experience, there's, there's something that it's like to be in that conscious experience. Here again, it's just, a, it's just a mark of the mental that we're aware of the internal states that we're going through. We're aware of our psychological states. We're conscious of our internal states, and there is a certain subjective character to the experiences that we have. Now, presumably, this goes for any. We're aware of it directly in, in our own case. Uh, and it seems a reasonable inference that with respect to any 
entity that is capable of having experiences, that is capable of having conscious experience, there is something that it's like to be inside that experience, as it were. So Nagel says the fact that an organism has conscious experience at all means basically there is something that it is like to be that organism. So this notion of the what it's like, here again, this is sometimes referred to as qualitative, the qualitative character of consciousness, or it's sometimes referred to as the phenomenal character of consciousness or the phenomenal character of mental states. There is something that it's like to have a certain experience and we're directly aware, we're conscious of this phenomenal character or qualitative character, or it's sometimes also called same idea kind of sometimes goes by the notion of the phenomenal content or the qualitative content of our mental states. There just is something that it's like, there's this distinctive qual qualitative character to having certain kinds of experiences to being in certain kinds of mental states. There's something that it's like to notice a particular shade of blue. There's something that it's like to inhale the aroma of Starbucks. There's something that it's like to hear the distinctive tone of an oboe. There just is a phenomenal character to all these different distinct conscious states that we go through. Now, his point in developing this thought in the form of a kind of thought experiment involving a bat is to bring out this fact that as he sees it, no matter how far our understanding of the brain advances, no matter how far our understanding of neurophysiology of the brain progresses, that's not going to get us any closer to understanding many essential features of the mind. And the feature that he's focusing on in this article is here again, this qualitative content, this phenomenal character, this what it's like, as it's come to be called, following, following Nagel's work on this topic. This what it's like, the phenomenal character or qualitative character or qualitative content of the experience is not going to be any better understood by giving an objective physical description of what is going on in the brain and the nervous system of the organism having the conscious experience. There is something that it's like to be a bat, but Nagel puts the thought experiment this way. Suppose you learn everything that there is to know about the workings of a bat's brain and nervous system. Suppose you become the world's foremost authority on the neurophysiology of bats. Nagel's point is all of that knowledge, all of that richly detailed objective description of what goes on at the level of brain and nervous system, none of that will get you any closer to understanding what it's like to be a bat. Because the subjective character of the experience, the, the phenomenal character of the experience can only, let me put it this way, is only, accept, is only accessible from the inside, as it were, from the point of view of the experiencing subject. But a physical analysis, a, a detailed physical, physical description of what is going on in the brain and the nervous system of the subject, that is objective by its very nature. Science gives objective descriptions. But as soon as you step out of that first person point of view, as soon as you step out of the perspective of the experiencing subject to give an objective third person point of view, you might say, of what is going on in the organism physically, that subjective character of the experience is no longer accessible. It's just in the nature of an objective description that the account of what is going on in the organism 
wouldn't make any reference to the what it's like, wouldn't make any reference to the subjective character, because that depends entirely on the perspective of the experiencing subject, on the perspective, on the first person point of view, as it were. So I suppose he chooses the example of a bat, because bats are in many ways so different from us, and it's so hard to imagine what their experiences must be like. They navigate the world in a way that is so different from what we're used to. Uh, they fly in caves by by dint of this mechanism of echolocation. They emit shrieks, and then they're able to tell where they are by this kind of sonar technique of hearing the echoes of their own shrieks. So the conscious states of a bat presumably represent the world in some way, but that representation uh, is quite different from the representation of the world that we have in our minds. So it's, it's really hard to imagine what it's like to be a bat. And Nagel's point here again is that it won't matter how far our knowledge of what happens in the bat's brain and nervous system advances. All that knowledge won't get us any closer to understanding what it's like to be a bat. Here again, the qualitative content of mental states or the qualitative character the phenomenal character, the subjective characters, as it's sometimes called, of conscious experience will always be left out of any objective physical description. An objective physical description is always given from the third person point of view. That's in the nature of, of scientific work. The thesis that water is H2O, say for example, that is accessible from many points of view. Any one of us can learn the relevant kinds of empirical procedures for proving that in the lab and go see that for ourselves. That's in the nature of scientific work, scientific inquiry, scientific discovery. It's all done, at, it's all done from the third person point of view. But the conscious experience of a subject is here again only ex accessible from one point of view. And if you leave out the subjective character of that experience, the phenomenal character of the what it's like, then you don't have a full account of the nature of the mind and the nature of that mental state. So there's a fundamental obstacle to reductionism, a reduction of the mental to the physical, simply identifying mental states with brain states. There's a fundamental obstacle to that ever working. That's Nagel's point in this in this article in his argument. The subject of character or the phenomenal quality of an experience is not reducible to any underlying physical state. Nagel writes, it is impossible to exclude the phenomenological features of experience from a reduction in the same way that one excludes the phenomenal features of any, uh, excuse me, of an ordinary substance from a physical or chemical reduction of it, namely by explaining them as effects on the minds of human observers. So part of the subjective character of our experience of water is that it's wet. And we can produce a physical reduction of water without any reference to that sensible quality, wetness. So here again, as I said before, reduction has been the way that science has advanced historically. Uh, over time, water was reduced to H2O, that is to say, the properties that it has at the macrophysical level, the level that we interact with it in perception, all those properties such as wetness were eventually shown to be a consequence of its structure at the microphysical level, the level below what is given to us in perception. Uh, in this case, it's molecular structure. Water was reduced to H2O. That was one example of a successful reduction in the history of science. Lightning was reduced to electricity. So that is the way that science has advanced. So water is H2O was a successful reduction. But when it comes to this relation between the mind and the brain. One cannot produce a reduction of the subjective character of my experience of water to some physical state, for example, to a brain state, because to do so 
would be to explain in terms of observable properties. A phenomenon that is essentially bound up with the first person point of view, the first person perspective. Here again, the way that I experience the water, its phenomenal quality, that is bound up with a point of view. So it's not possible to give a physical description of that phenomenal quality because any physical description, any kind of physical reduction would have to be given here again as a kind of objective physical description. So there's just a fundamental obstacle to ever carrying through a reduction of the mind to the brain. Here again I'm focusing on Nagel's criticism of the notion that the mental could simply be reduced to the physical and in this article he's mainly focusing on what we've called identity theory, the notion that the mind could be reduced to the brain. But everything that he has to say about that of course would apply to all versions of materialism. So all of these criticisms would apply to functionalism as well, although functionalism is not the focus of his critique uh, in this article. But of course we've looked at Searle's extensive criticisms of functionalism. So the what it's like to notice, say, a particular shade of blue, that can be left out of account in a physical reduction of the color property. So the way that the physicist describes the color blue, of course, makes no reference to what it's like to have the experience of perceiving it. None of that plays any role in what we might call the physicist's description of the color blue. The physicist might just describe it as light of a certain wavelength. That would be a physical description of the color property. But that physical description doesn't tell us anything about the mental state of perceiving a particular shade of blue, does it? The what it's like cannot be left out of a full account of that mental state. The phenomenological features of the mental state are essential to it. So you leave that out, you're no longer talking about the same thing. So again, this phenomenal character or phenomenological character or content of mental states, the qualitative content of mental states, this what it's like. This is another of the marks of the mental. So we've talked about consciousness, the fact that we're aware of our internal states, that's an important distinguishing feature of the mental. Intentionality, again here again, the fact that our mental states represent the world in various ways. And again, the phenomenal character or qualitative character or phenomenal content or phenomenal quality of the mental states, the what it's like. That's essential to mental states. That's in part what makes them what they are. But that can never be given a reduction. That can never be given an objective physical description in terms of here again, some objective physical process or processes that could be described from the third person point of view. That isn't possible because as soon as you step out of the first person perspective, as soon as you step outside of the point of view of the experiencing subject going through the what it's like, then something has been left behind, as it were, in your account of that mental state. So here again, Nagel is similar to Serral in his criticism. He's not saying that I'm skeptical that the physical reduction will ever be carried through for some reason like, well, I just don't think brain science will ever advance to that degree of sophistication. He's saying no, right right at the outset, right before the, right before the race even, even starts, right? There's a conceptual impossibility here or it would certainly appear to be an impossibility. At the very least, there's a basic conceptual obstacle to even beginning the reduction. That is, here again, Nagel's gift for focusing in on very specific conceptual and logical steps in the way some theory is articulated or presented in finding, uh, finding some very substantive philosophical issue that's been overlooked. 
Nagel's point about the irreducibility of qualitative character means the reduction is in principle not possible for mental states. So if he's right, he's exposed a, a fatal objection to any materialist theory of mind. It's not just that a reduction is never going to succeed because of the empirical difficulties involved. Maybe maybe the difficulties involved in empirical research on the brain progressing after a certain point. You say, no, in principle, it can't work because there's a very basic conceptual confusion in this whole theory. The notion, namely, that you could give an objective physicalist account of the subjective character of experience. Here again, this phenomenal quality or qualitative character of the experience that is bound up with a certain point of view. But a reduction by its very nature has to depart from any subjective point of view. So one way that he gets the idea across is in terms of a distinction between physical facts and experiential facts. So physical facts are accessible from many points of view. And here again, the description of phenomena in terms of the physical facts is the hallmark of science. That's the characteristic of scientific inquiry into phenomena. To explain phenomena in terms of physical facts that are accessible from many points of view. And here again, there have been many successful reductions in the <clears throat> history of science. The laws of optics were eventually reduced to laws of electromagnetism. Laws of thermodynamics were eventually reduced to laws of st statistical mechanics. Here again, water was reduced to H2O. Lightning was reduced to electricity. It has been characteristic of scientific progress that it is worked by reduction, showing some higher level phenomenon can be explained in terms of some lower level phenomenon. That's how science has advanced. But that's not going to happen with respect to the relation between mind, the study of the mind on the one hand, and brain science on the other hand, according to Nagel, and there's a fundamental obstacle to it ever working. Namely, here again, Part of what is to be explained in an adequate theory of mind would be the experiential facts, the what it's like, the phenomenal character, the, the qualitative content, the subjective character of the experience. That is part of what is to be explained by a theory of mind, but that is only accessible from one point of view. It's not accessible from the reductionist, objective, third-person point of view of scientific description. It's not accessible from that point of view. It's only accessible from the point of view of the conscious subject having the experience. So there's a general difficulty about psychophysical reduction. Here again, psycho psychophysical reduction would be the reduction of the psychological to the physical. If reductionism, if materialist accounts of mind were correct, then in principle it would be possible to give a reduction of the psychological to the physical. Perhaps psychology would eventually be subsumed to physics, and there would no longer be any need for the special science of psychology. Everything to be explained in terms of our internal lives, in, turn, in terms of all the internal states that we go through, perhaps it could all be described one day in terms of the kinds of causal laws that the physical sciences discover. Newton's laws of motion, Kepler's laws of planetary motion, Newton's universal law of gravitation, Galileo's law of falling bodies, Galileo's other laws and dynamics, laws of thermodynamics, laws of electromagnetism, all the different kinds of causal laws that the physical sciences discover. If at some point in the study of the brain, causal laws uh, if the neural and bio ac biochemical activity in the brain were completely figured out such that you could predict everything that is ever going to happen, given your, all you would have to know is the initial state of the brain, 
and the relevant causal laws, you could predict, predict everything that, that would ever happen in that brain. And you could show that everything that ever happens in a mind is determined by those causal laws that govern what happens in a brain, then that would be a psychophysical reduction. That would be a completion of the reduction of the psychological to the physical. And presumably psychology would come to an end and be subsumed under physics. Psychology would no longer be necessary. Nagel, as we've seen, does not think that that is possible, and there's a general difficulty about it. It's not some specific problem. It's not some specific problem to do with limits to how far neurophysio neurophysiology of the brain can advance as, a, as an empirical science. It's not that. It's a general difficulty. Namely, reduction is general. It is a move away from dependence on a particular point of view. Now, this is not possible for experience. Here again, you move away from the point of view of the subject having the experience and you're no longer giving a full account of the mental state because then you're leaving out the phenomenal character. You're leaving out the qualitative content of the experience because that is bound up with the point of view of the subject having the experience. In the case of experience, unlike physical objects and properties, there is no appearance reality gap. So what is meant here by appearance reality gap? Well, we might say that the way that water appears to us, the way that it's given to us in perception, the way that it's given to us in, in the sense of our tactile interaction with it, our experience of it is wet, and other sensuous features of it, colorless, odorless, clear, so the way that it's given to us in visual experience, uh, the wetness of it. You might say that reduction involves moving away from all of those features of the substance's appearance and getting down to the reality of it. The reality, so to speak, is that all of that, all of those properties at the gross level, all of those sensible properties of water at the macrophysical level, those are all explained. Those are all determined. Those are all fully accounted for by its molecular structure. So the microphysical structure of the substance is the reality of it, you might say. And there's a kind of appearance reality gap. The way that it's given to us in experience is not the, is not the ultimately explanatory reality of it. So there's a kind of appearance reality gap. But in the case of experience, there is no appearance reality gap. The way that your experience seems to you is the way that it is. You, you, you can't be wrong about the way the, the world seems to you. Of course, you can be wrong about the way that the world is in, in, in lots of ways. But when it comes to our mental states, when it comes to our experiences, they're incorrigible. That is to say, they cannot be corrected by later empirical research, you might say, or deeper empirical, deeper physical analysis, right? So if it seems to you that you're in pain, you, you, you can't be wrong about that, right? Some, some later physical analysis of what is going on in you at the level of maybe neural activity, biochemical activity of the brain, if that analysis were to show, oh, look, no, you were wrong, you weren't really in pain, that, that makes no sense, right? You know if you're in pain or not. Here again, it's characteristic of the phenomenal character of experience that we're immediately aware of it. We have kind of direct access to the fact of the matter. You can't be wrong about the way that, the, that experience, the way that your experiences seem to you. You can't, you can't be wrong about that. You can be wrong about how the world is, but you can't be wrong about how the world seems to you. So in the case of experience, there is no appearance reality gap. Oh, you thought you were in pain, but actually you weren't. This objective physical analysis of what was going on in you actually shows that you weren't. No, that would make no sense, right? You know what the phenomenal character of your experience is. So uh, psychophysical reduction 
can't work for those reasons. And here again, increased objectivity cannot give us a better understanding of the subjective character of experience. It's not as if that objective physical description of what is going on in your brain at the level of neural and biochemical activity, it's not as if that's going to give you a better understanding of the subjective character of your experience. You already know what it's like. You already are directly, immediately aware. You're already conscious of the phenomenal character of the experience without need for some third-person objective physical description of what is going on in your brain. It's not as if that's going to shed any further light on the, what it's like on the subjective character of the experience. So for all these reasons, there's a fundamental obstacle to the very possibility of psychophysical reduction, according to Nagel. Indeed, we don't even have an adequate conception of what it would mean for an experience to be objective. Here again, experience is bound up with the first person perspective. It's bound up with the point of view of the subject having the experience. So we don't even know what it would mean for an experience to be objective. So this is a general obstacle to the possibility of a psychophysical reduction. Here again, you would have to depart from the what it's like in giving that reduction, in giving that objective physical description. But that objective physical description, if it departs from the what it's like, then it leaves something out of account with respect to uh, a th what a theory of mind is supposed, is supposed to explain, or at least part of what a theory of mind is supposed to give a full accounting of. Very little work has been done. Nagel says, on the basic question, whether any sense can be made of experiences having an objective character at all. We cannot genuinely understand the hypothesis that their nature is captured in a physical description unless we understand the more fundamental idea that they have an objective nature, or that objective processes can have a subjective nature. But here again, we don't even, there's no sense to even be assigned to this notion, at least as presently conceived, according to Nagel. This sense of an experience having an objective character. Nagel says there's a conceptual obstacle right there in even beginning a reduction. We, namely, we have no sense of what that would mean. What would it mean for an experience to be objective? Here again, an objective physical description is given from the third person point of view. It's not bound up with the first person perspective. It's not bound up with any point of view. But the subjective character of experience is bound up with a specific point of view. So by its very nature, it can't be given uh, a third person, uh, an objective physical description.